I'm Bob Oakley, a retired ambassador here at the National Defense University. The video you're about to watch will provide you an orientation on the military. It's intended for the civilian community and humanitarian aid organizations which will work directly or liaise with or simply encounter members of an official military establishment during the planning and execution of complex emergencies anywhere in the world. This video is part of a more complete DVD product that contains supplemental material including documents and interviews that can be accessed from a personal computer, which together will provide a more complete picture. For brevity, we focused on the U.S. military, so it's important to keep in mind that every nation has a different approach, a different structure for its own defense apparatus. The sponsors of this video feel, as I do, that providing you with insights on the U.S. military, how it is structured, what are its general approaches to cooperation with international and non-governmental organizations, in various situations and what you can expect when you work alongside military forces will ultimately help to improve the lives of the affected populations. You're fortunate that you're going to have retired General Carl Fulford as your host who will explain this video and explore some of the supplemental material with you. I hope that you and your organization will have a greater understanding of the military and that your work will be considerably enhanced as a direct result of this process. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Carl Fulford, your host for Civil-Military Relations, working with the military. More than ever, military personnel are required to perform non-traditional, that is, non-combat activities, and to fulfill non-combatant roles, even in the midst of conflict. Also increasing are instances of direct interface between military personnel, affected populations, and civilian responders to response, armed conflict, and peace support operations. In complex contingency operations and stability operations, or complex emergencies as the civilian community may refer to them, the goal of the military is the creation of a secure environment, that is, one that is free of violent conflict and permits the humanitarian sector to operate effectively. Common ground between civilians and the military, and it generates a need for understanding and improved coordination between them. While military forces are as varied as the nations they serve and the missions they are assigned, they share many common characteristics unique to the military profession. Some of the questions we will attempt to answer are, what is the military? How is the military structured? How does it operate? What are the rules within which the military functions? We will also identify some mechanisms the military has developed to assist with coordination. The military is an armed force that works in the sovereign state. The Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 ushered in the era of professional army as an exclusive instrument of government. The alternative was and still remains in several notable places, personal armies or militias loyal to a single individual or political party. NGOs encounter militias and irregular paramilitaries military forces, they are military forces, whether they, uh, whether we view them that, that way or not, whether we perceive them to be professionally trained sovereign nations who have a strict protocol, military protocols, guidelines, rules, and regulations. In its most basic form, the military's primary role is the defense of the nation, including the integrity of its territory, control of its property, and preservation of the lives of its citizens at home or abroad. Militaries are instruments of the governments of the nation they serve and reflective of the indigenous cultures they come from. Our military is never um, insubordinate to civilian. Uh, our citizen soldiery comes from our citizen, you know, our citizens. It's our base. So we feel like we, we wish to represent and reflect our society in, in all ways, in constitutional ways, in social ways, etc. A nation may choose to assign its military forces additional tasks beyond their primary mission to include designing and building infrastructure such as bridges and dams, responding to natural and man-made disasters, responding to internal security disturbances that threaten peace and security such as riots and insurgencies, and participating in a regional or international coalition or UN mission. 
In many countries around the world, police functions are carried out by their military forces, that is, by their federal armed forces. Uh, they have departments of the interior that use federal military power to maintain stability and, and order and so forth. Military forces and their civilian leadership carry out their activities on three levels. Policy making, planning, the Department of Defense receives direction from the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense. The Department of Defense is broadly divided between the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Staff. The Office of the Secretary of Defense is responsible for policy guidance. Policy direction is passed through the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. There are various points at which a ministry or Department of Defense interfaces with other ministries or departments depending on the circumstances. These activities are part of the interagency process. The evolving nature of conflict is such that no one government, ministry, department, or agency has sufficient resources, expertise, or authority to respond unilaterally. In conflict interventions, the U.S. Department of Defense is responsible for the establishment of a secure environment in order to facilitate the restoration of civil order. However, there are many tasks required to rebuild a nation's infrastructure and society for which executive departments other than defense have the necessary expertise. If the international police are armed only with, in fact in Bosnia they weren't armed at all, but uh, with a sidearm, uh, and the military come only with heavy weaponry and lethal force, there's a gap. We could call it the public security gap. And that has to be filled by some organized unit with non-lethal non force, crowd and riot control. That could be done by military police, and we call them multinational specialized units today in Bosnia and Kosovo. It can be done by organized units of uh, police. We call them specialized police units in, uh, in Kosovo. Either uh, organization, or civilian or military, could provide them but effectively, and that capability needs to be present. In order to sort out who's responsible for what, um, and, and particularly if there are concerns uh, by the larger humanitarian community about military involvement in humanitarian operations, either any involvement or the degree or the types of projects and vision to be carried out, that needs to be taken up firstly on the ground between the senior uh, UN person as well as the NGO consortia, the NGO group there with the local commanders. And it needs to be taken up at headquarters as well, whether the headquarters is in Brussels or Washington or Tampa or Stuttgart or wherever to sort of sort things out. I think now that we're getting to a stage where civil military relationships are cementing better than they were before. I think there was a gap in the middle uh, in the beginning of these kinds of operations where Civilians did their things, military did their things. There was a real culture clash. Uh, but I think now that people are beginning to realize that nothing happens unless there's stability and security. And that is a job that has to be done by civilians and military together. Often the problem one runs into is that being with the military, as you know, is a rather large organization. And uh, you would see that word doesn't necessarily get out and around or is accepted by all the different components. Uh, so you have different looks in different parts of the country from the same military force. Um, and also once things get started, we've observed there is a, a certain momentum that occurs. Uh, that, um, and sometimes it's hard to stop. While the President and the Secretary of Defense have the constitutional authority to direct the armed forces of the United States, it is Congress that authorizes expenditures related to the Department of Defense activities and major operations. Budgets are developed for every military operation. The U.S. military divides its global responsibilities into five geographic areas covered by five joint combatant commands, Pacific Command, Central Command, Southern Command, European Command, and Northern Command. Anytime the word joint is used within a military context, it connotes activities, operations, and organizations in which elements of two or more military services from the same country participate. The word combined denotes activities that involve military forces from more than one country. 
A four-star flag or general officer level individual is the commander of U.S. military operations in each of the assigned geographic areas of operation or theaters. These individuals are called combatant commanders. Each regional combatant commander is responsible for all U.S. military geographic area of responsibility. Combatant commanders receive direction from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Joint Combatant Command Headquarters are organized into six main command staff designations. The J-1 is the Administration Directorate. It deals with internal personnel issues. The J-2, or Intelligence Directorate, gathers, analyzes, and reports on information, including classified information. J-3 is the Operations Directorate. It focuses mainly on current operations. J-4, the Logistics Directorate, provides internal support for the combatant command which may be extended to provide support to disaster victims. The J-5 Plans and Policies Directorate is normally the place where Civil Military Operations Center and other civil military liaison structures will plug into the military staff structure. The J-6 or Communications Directorate provides all telecommunications needs. In addition to the uh, J-1 through J-6 that you've just heard about, uh, combatant commands are continuously changing and they adapt uh, to requirements uh, that are continually developing. A good example is in this command, uh, we now have a J-7 that's responsible for readiness and training. For the management and execution of military operations, the combatant commander will normally create a Joint Task Force, or JTF. A JTF is established when a mission involves two or more military services on a significant scale and requires a close integration of effort to meet specific military objectives. Leaders typically do not lead operations themselves. The combatant commander designates a commander for the JTF, who is likely to be the one-star brigadier general or equivalent rank. In order to achieve influence at the most appropriate and effective level, humanitarian sector personnel should be aware of who they need to talk to and at what level of rank, which will generally be an area operations officer holding the rank of colonel or lieutenant colonel. Uniform military forces may include Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Border Patrol, a National Police Force, and other armed services as a nation requires. Each service has its own organizational structure, particular roles and functions, and to a certain extent, its own unique culture. Most are composed of enlisted personnel, non-commissioned officers, and commissioned officers. The primary function of commissioned officers is to provide overall organizational management and leadership. In the United States, commissioned officers receive their authority from Congress and serve at the discretion of the U.S. Senate and President. Not all commissioned officers perform combat duties. Some such as doctors, nurses, lawyers, and chaplains cannot command combat troops. Military mission usually focuses on security-related tasks. A UN mission, on the other hand, will usually have a much broader factors relevant to a functioning civil society. The, the first act that gives legitimacy to international intervention is the United Nations Security Council resolution. And that will usually establish where the military are uh, under UN command, wearing blue helmets, uh, and subject to uh, the ways that the United Nations uh, requires and subject to the mandate, a very strict mandate sometimes. Uh, namely, yes, they may use uh, military force, uh, but only in certain circumstances. Uh, and then there will be a civil police operation as part of the, the, the whole mission and the, uh, the, all the civilian, political, legal, humanitarian as well. But the Security Council may also uh, adopt a resolution whereby they give what one might call a hunting license 
uh, to a, a multinational force, a coalition of the willing. Now, in those circumstances, what the legitimacy comes from the resolution, and there is a lead nation, and that lead nation then gathers together the military forces of other nations who are willing to contribute. They wear their own uniforms, they don't wear blue helmets, and that force commander uh, um, operates according to, within the mandate of the Security Council resolution, but according to national command. When there is a UN-led operation, like a clear line of command and control and boundaries, you know, in very close coordination and liaison with, with the French national authorities and with the European Union, we made it very clear who was doing what, where our authority stopped and where the multinational force came in and, and did their work. And at a certain moment we had a handover back from the multinational force to the UN-led force because we had in the meantime brought in reinforcements. The military has a distinct culture. This culture includes a set of rules, regulations, viewpoints, perspectives, and operating procedures, both written and unwritten. When I think of military culture, the things that come to my mind are definitely structure and discipline. And then the thing that I like most about the military culture is um, the camaraderie and the esprit de corps that you get from working with a group of individuals. Military culture places heavy emphasis on hierarchy, chain of command, tradition, rules, regulations, rituals, and customs, training, and distinctive dress and insignias. Emphasis in training is on battle and survival skills, fitness, operational security, and combat readiness. Military leaders are taught to be assertive, decisive, tenacious, and confident. This does not mean that the military culture does not support initiative when the situation requires it. Officers and troops who are well disciplined and well trained, and the basis of that training is that you train for war. And on top of that you get that, that special skill of peacekeeping, which I described, you know, one moment you have to use force according to the rules of engagement from using force, because you, you talk yourself through a difficult situation. Although military personnel are part of society, they have different roles and responsibilities from the average citizen. The military profession permits the use of deadly force. Concurrently, the responsibility of military leadership permits the sacrifice of soldiers' lives in order to achieve military objectives. These differences from what would be considered criminal acts in civilian society has traditionally been a distinguishing feature of military life. Whether you're a cook in the army or you're a medic or you're an infantryman, we all have a common, common goal, and it's defense of our country. So by putting on that uniform, you, you assume that role and you assume that identity, and you take with that all those things that you decided to do when you raised your right hand and did the oath to defend your country. Nations typically impose a distinct code of conduct or set of rules on their military personnel. In addition to the norms that apply to civilian society in order to regulate their behavior. Military personnel may still be tried in civilian courts. A UN peacekeeper, we have a code of conduct for them, we have, um, they are very clearly briefed on that and so um, the, uh, anyone who works in the field with them can expect that that is the circumstances that they are well within a disciplined organization who will discipline them if they do not meet um, the requirements of them. Militaries devote a large part of their time and resources to education and training activities. This training culture is key to maintaining unit readiness and combat effectiveness. Centers where realistic joint large-scale live fire exercises are held. Initial entry training informally called boot camp, is an individual service process that varies between 6 and 13 weeks. Each armed service offers advanced training that builds on the foundation established in basic training. Advanced individual training is usually the next stage for those assigned a job specialty prior to enlistment or during basic recruit training. 
This is where specialized skills are learned. Advanced individual training is normally conducted in a classroom environment. Advanced training schools last from a few weeks to a few months, depending on the complexity of the subject matter. There are over 4,100 individual specialties, 10,000 courses, and more than 300 military training centers in the United States. With rare exception, commissioned officers in the U.S. military have a four-year bachelor's degree. Doctrine is the body of fundamental principles by which military forces guide their actions in support of national objectives. It is our judgment and application. If both sides understand they have doctrines, but they're just different doctrines, they understand they have different language, different acronyms, I think it would be easier to work with each other, to respect each other's institutional history. While joint doctrine exists in the U.S. Department of Defense, there is currently no interagency doctrine, although there are guidelines for interagency coordination. There are some places where we've seen very good models. Sierra Leone was one, where there was a parallel initiative on the civilian side to really build the police capacity um, and the local government's ability to manage, to pay salaries, to do training and deployment. We have a big problem right now, for instance, in Liberia where the peacekeepers have no authority to arrest anyone. And unfortunately, there's virtually no civilian police to arrest anyone, and there are a lot of bad characters that need to be arrested and brought to justice and incarcerated if, if necessary. Each military operation will have rules of engagement, also called ROE, which are directives issued by competent military authority that delineate the degree and circumstances under which force is permitted. ROE defines the situations when the military can use force, can detain people, and so on. Violating rules of engagement will result in discipline, and the degree of discipline is determined by the severity of the infraction. Rules of engagement during traditional combat operations are fairly standard and clear. An international humanitarian law provided for by the Geneva Conventions applies. The difficulty for, um, well, for a military organization with lethal force, but even even if they have been uh, equipped with crowd and riot control capability. And are they allowed to use lethal force to defend buildings? This is a real issue. So what happens if there are people in those buildings, and of course they can use force to protect them, but once they're evacuated, their homes or museums or whatever it might be can be ransacked and burned to the ground, which is what happened. So it's a real dilemma, uh, especially if it's a wide-scale situation. How will the military's cultural characteristics influence the nature of interactions between it and other organizations, particularly those involved in humanitarian response activities? What is the impact of the military's culture during the execution of humanitarian operations? Organizational behavior becomes critical where and when it intersects with the organizational behavior of other groups, such as in meetings, during coordination and information sharing, deployment, and even the general operational view of the mission. Military personnel will expect meetings to be highly structured and efficiently managed. Emphasis is placed on meeting the leader's information needs as succinctly as possible. The sole outcome of the meeting will be assumed to be assignments dictated by leadership. Information is usually provided by way of a formal presentation, which is called a to learn that there are sometimes a single memo can say as much as a hundred page PowerPoint presentation. You know, the power of distilling down what you really want to say. But there are other times when a visual presentation with maps and so forth helps an audience get a context that is critical. 
Meetings attended by autonomous agencies that are expecting a consensus approach to issue a resolution may be viewed by them indecisive to the point where military personnel will attempt to assert leadership in an erroneous, though sincere, effort to help. Civilian responders uh, have to keep in mind that uh, the uh, military are a hierarchical uh, authoritarian uh, institution uh, trained to take charge in any situation in which they find themselves. Because of a concern for operational security, military personnel will likely show reluctance to share information about planned activities. At the same time, however, you can expect that the military will seek in-depth information about civilian activities in an attempt to better understand the environment in which they are operating. Uh, if, it's, if it's in the context of a contingency plan, it's so highly classified that not all the players that need to be part of this plan can, can access the plan. Some of the ugly in Afghanistan is when we would gather at a meeting, uh, they would be providing us with information, let's say, on things that are happening in areas that they're in, uh, maybe security concerns or, you know, um, anything of that nature, projects that they're doing and so forth. And when it gets to our turn to speak, they're expecting us to be able to provide some kind of information like that back to them, or at least a confirmation that, yeah, that did happen over there. And a lot of times we can't provide that information because um, some things are classified either because the information itself is classified or the way that we got it, the source that provided us the information. So while we want to tell you guys uh, and the NGOs what is going on, a lot of times we're, we have our hands tied and we're just not allowed to provide that stuff. When the military deploys, its goal is to be as self-sustaining and self-reliant as possible. The percentage of combat troops to support troops extending all the way to civilian support structures is often referred to as the tooth-to-tail ratio. The appropriate ratio can be a hotly debated topic within the broader defense community. Many civilians perceive the average amount of support to be excessive. The is, and it is greatly influenced by the goals and anticipated duration of the mission. One of the misperceptions that I've encountered in dealing with some of the NGOs um, when I am downrange is that they think we have a lot of stuff. They look around, they see we have a lot of trucks, we got um, engineer equipment, we have deep mining equipment, we have everything. And they all think that we have deep pockets as well. There's different kinds of money. And there is uh, money that is allowed to be spent on certain types of things. So a lot of times we will have money, but legally we are not allowed to spend it on some of the humanitarian type projects or reconstruction projects that the NGOs would like us to be helping them to uh, fund and to finish. And then the same holds true with the equipment as well. We have demining equipment. I saw it personally when I was in Bosnia. Um, there's mines everywhere in Bosnia. The need to weren't allowed to actually use our own equipment to go out and do that mission. At the strategic level, some military leaders may be concerned that support to non-combat or non-warfighting operations will decrease the military's ability to perform their primary security role. Of great concern is mission creep, a situation that occurs when armed forces take on broader or additional missions or an extended commitment beyond those for which they initially planned, as defined by the military. Mission creep is costly and can result in loss of life and expenditure of resources not associated with completion of their primary mission. I think the military is more for an immediate return, um, accomplishment of the mission, uh, very quick to try to measure success, all of which is good, measures of effectiveness. But it doesn't necessarily always lend itself to the kinds of uh, operations that, that we are carrying out uh, for the long run. Military forces at the tactical field level, including the average foot soldier, may perceive their implementation of community support activities as something they can personally feel good about because it helps local civilians. These attitudes may even be encouraged because they build positive morale. Military forces at this level are much less likely to be aware that this community support is being delivered as a part of a strategic level support strategy, which
which may be at odds with the requirements for long-term success and stability. Internal force protection will be an important consideration for the military. Force protection is a security program designed to ensure adequate protection of soldiers, civilian employees, facilities, and equipment that are part of the military organization. Force protection strategy may include activities that are designed to increase local acceptance of the force's presence. Well, what we're trying to do today is to bring health care to the Afghan people, that we have a, a really bright team of doctors and nurses uh, from the Air Force, the Navy, and from the Army. And we've come out here with the uh, MPs for force protection. And we set up a clinic in the school that the uh, provisional government has given us access to. The militaries of many countries have a cadre of experts or specialists who support linkages to civil societies. The role of these specialists is to help ensure that civilians are kept out of the way of combat activities, including civilians working for their own government, as well as those of the nation their military is engaged in. In other kinds of operations, these specialists may be responsible for coordinating the assets of the military that may be applied to relief and rebuilding activities. So my job is to find the experts in the local area um, to help rebuild and also, if I can, to find the NGOs that can actually come behind me when I start these projects to finish long-term projects. Mine are short-term. Personnel from usually staff the U.S. military's civil military coordination mechanisms. In crisis involving joint and combined forces, they serve alongside their equivalent specialists from the militaries of other nations who are supporting the mission. The function of these specialists is to provide the interface between the military and the civilian populace, organizations, and government. A U.S. civil affairs officer is always a military man, usually a reserve officer drawn from civilian life, therefore brings to the issue quite a lot of knowledge but for the time being is in uniform and is under military control. For large-scale disasters, humanitarian organizations will work most often with the U.S. military as represented by the JTF through the Civil Military Operations Center, or CMOC, which usually functions under the J-5 designation but may also function under to the commander through his or her chief of staff. I had a problem yesterday uh, regarding uh, the escort to the vehicle of the Kansuma for the opening ceremony in that uh, an unexpected truckload of Unimix uh, presented itself for the trip as well. Uh, they, they were not configured to support a, a food convoy, so I would ask uh, if you, if you see the need to do that again, if you will coordinate that through the civil affairs, we can have the proper security there, but there's not proper security to, to move food up there yesterday. These mechanisms are within the military structure and organization, or behind the wire, as the military would describe it. NATO uses a different mechanism called a Civil Military Cooperation Center, or CIMIC Center, which is similar in function to a CMOC but usually inclusive of civilian perspectives. Another important difference is that the CIMIC Center is accessible to the general public. Regardless of how they are labeled, these organizational structures are the initial focal points, or as the military would say, the initial centers of gravity for cooperation and coordination between the military and civilian organizations in disaster relief operations. If the, the, the U.S. military has intelligence, is it in security in a particular location? They need to tell the NGOs and the U.N. agencies that it's very dangerous to go in there. In fact, they would advise them not to do it. Aid workers will make their own decisions, but the sharing of intelligence is important. I'm sure that prior to watching this video, you had some knowledge of the content it contained but I'm hopeful that you also learned a few things you were not aware of. I'm Carl Fulford, and it has been my pleasure to be your host for Civil Military Relations, working with the military.
Thank you. Hello, my name is Pete Bradford. In behalf of my colleagues at ITEA and the U.S. Pacific Command Center for Excellence in Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance, I would like to convey special thanks to General Fulford, Ambassador Oakley, and our other distinguished contributors in making this video on working with the military. I would also like to leave you with a final thought. Military doctrine, procedures, and tactics are in constant transition as all militaries seek to address new threats to international security and stability. Quite recently, U.S. Pacific Command, in responding to the catastrophic consequences of the Indian Ocean tsunami, engaged in an unprecedented level of collaboration with United Nations and NGO humanitarian organizations in responding to the needs of victims. While this does not completely capture the future of civil military coordination, it suggests that thinking and expectations about coordination across civil military lines will inevitably change. We hope this video will provide a point of departure for those who will have contact with the military in the field in the future so that they can begin to de develop new approaches to civil military coordination and that the improved performance from this better coordination will promote the long-term stability and security objectives that both civilians and the military share. Thank you.